welcome to Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacey Spanos, your host for this series of programs designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Massachusetts. In today's program, we'll discuss the House of God, architecture, vestments, and religious articles used within the church. Our distinguished guests are Dr. Helen C. Evans. She holds the position of Mary and Michael Jeharis Curator for Byzantine Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Nice to have you here. We also have here today Dr. Anton C. Vrame. He is the Director of Religious Education for the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America and also author of the book, The Educating Icon. Thank you for being with us today. Dr. Evans, let's begin with you. Orthodox church architecture is certainly very distinct. How so? Explain to us the many different facets of the church. Well, Orthodox church architecture, as we think of it, is like the building we're in, a centrally focused um, building with a dome. Um, originally, Orthodox church architecture was far more varied, and you see it's the Monastery of St. Catherine at Sinai, a church built by a the Emperor Justinian, which is still a basilica. But by today, we think generally of this tradition that begins really in the middle Byzantine period where the church is brought together in, in a very protective to me, uh, very enveloping space where you enter through the narthex, where you leave the secular world and prepare to come into the holy. In the Middle Ages, there were often tombs in that area. And then into the nave, which is where we the lay public um, gather, and then you have the icon screen, the iconostasis, the barrier, and beyond it, the apse with the altar, which is where the Eucharist is prepared, and therefore in many ways the most sacred part. And above us, we are um, protected in a way by an image of Christ, Pantocrator, in the dome above the portion where we, the congregation, are. And in the apse, the image of the Virgin who is a mediator. She is of earth and of heaven and mediates between us. Um, there are many, many ways to read these images and um, they all speak to reaching from the, the earthly level to the um, divine. Let's go back to the narthex. This is the, the front doors. The front door, you the walk vestibule, in. the foyer. And what does that signify there, the narthex? It's the transitional space. You, as Helen was saying, you, you're in the world. You're walking down the street, and you just don't want to jump in to this holy environment that the church building is. And so the narthex, the entryway, becomes this transitional space where you can begin to focus, begin to observe your dedication by lighting a candle, venerating the, uh, an icon, greeting your neighbor, uh, that kind of, so that you're pre preparing you to walk into the nave and participate in the worship service, the liturgy of that day, the, whatever it happens to be. So then you enter the nave. Right. What is the decorum for being in the nave? <laughs> decorum for the nave, and the interesting word is the nave means naft, it comes from naftis, which means the ship. It's the ark, we're, so we're in this ark and we're gathered around uh, to uh, hear the words of the prayers, to attend to the scriptural readings, to sing the hymns of praise that the congregation will sing to God, um, and then to participate in the Sunday liturgy, the Eucharist, in the meal, the Last Supper, where it's being recreated in some ways for us so that we can participate in Holy Communion. So at a very practical level, you should be respectful. You should be recognizing you're in a holy place. We think of the sanctuary behind the icon screen as the holy place, but it's the holy of holies. This is the holy place. And so we really should be respectful, proper decorum and behavior. You know, it's not a place to go running around and things like that. And the altar is, of course, where the mystery of Christ kind of all comes together for Orthodox Christians. Tell me about some of the things in the altar. Dr. Well, Evans. The, the objects that are on the altar, and we have some of them here, are the objects that are used to prepare and then to serve the Eucharist, which is an evocation of the Last Supper and the gathering together of the disciples with Christ. 
and we in a way become part of that brotherhood of disciples by the activity of participating in this event. The, we don't actually know what the first Christians in 50 AD um, used for the Eucharist, but they have to have had a container that held liquid and they have to have had something that held bread because he said to take the bread and the wine in memory of him. Um, we have these works that show in a way the fact that all the, the traditions remain the same, they also evolve. And the two silver pieces, probably pewter, are copies of a patent, the flat dish for the bread and the chalice for the wine from the sixth century. This is a replica of something that was used in the sixth century, so very simple. So 500s, um, very simple, but the original would have been a yard wide the and it would have been, the plate. the plate would have been silver. It's the original, there are examples at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington. They are huge. They speak of a, an immense number of people coming together to participate. And if you look at the chalice, this one is maybe half or a third of the side of the original. So you have a, a huge, very welcoming bowl for the wine and a small knob so that you would be holding it separately. And back in the, the olden days, did they sip from the cup? Now the priest gives us, feeds us through a spoon, for lack right. of a better and, phrase. Uh, the, the practice of using the spoon came about, as I'm told, in the ninth, 10th century. Prior to that, yes, people would have partaken straight from the cup itself or the cup would have, a large cup could be used in a, for a large congregation, then parceled out into smaller cups for people to drink from. But this became a much more efficient way of doing it and also allowing, there was a concern for the proper respect that you don't come here and gulp from this chalice. Right. You just take a sip, that's, you know, so this idea that you can kind of imagine somebody say, well, if I, if I just drink more, I'll be more holy or be better communion. Or I'm sick, maybe I'll get a little I'll bit get better. A little, a little, yeah, and so the church wants to say, no, 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 a, a, just a, a small a spoonful is enough. is enough. So talk to me about the difference in the styles here. Well, it, it, it goes back to um, all the things that have happened. The Christianity has existed now for more than 2,000 years and what was the style of one century is replaced by the style of the other. The use remains the same. What I find fascinating about the evolution is that it becomes more the theatrical, uh, that the chalice is now here and you have a large space. So you have something that you can present quite dramatically and the patent has also been put on a stand. So the, the ability of the congregation perhaps to see in to the altar and to see what is happening is clearer. Or these would have been used before the icons block the view of the altar. It may have been a different sense of what is a type of performance uh, that we are invited from this section to participate in without actually, particularly for women, entering this, um, the holiest of holy ourselves. That's right, because yeah. women do not have access to the sanctuary. To the sanctuary. With uh, just a couple of he here exceptions with the proper blessing to do a task. Technically, no person who doesn't have a task, male or female, is allowed in the sanctuary. But in a convent, a nun may enter the sanctuary or something like that. Uh, tell me about something that, uh, embarrassingly enough, I just learned about um, <laughs> shortly after, well, September 11th, 2001. In many churches, and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. is it all churches, there is something called a relic in the sanctuary. Well, what is that? Well, a relic is a piece, usually a bone fragment, because they can last a long time, uh, of, the saint, of a saint. But it could be a relic of other items as well. Uh, but we'll leave it with the, the saints, a part of their body, a part of a bone, a fragment. And this becomes another connection between the believer, the faithful, and this individual. You're in, by being in the presence of the relic, you're being in the presence of the person whose relic it is. And in the church, going back to the very early on, second century, Christians would gather around the relics of their saints 
to celebrate the Eucharist, to pray, to sing praises to God, honor the life of this usually frequently martyr, and participate in the life of the church in this way. And so today, the relics could be placed in, a, in the table, in the altar table, as part of the consecration of a church, so that to remind us of this gathering around the body, the relic of the saint, but they could also be placed in small reliquaries, just as fancy or as simple as these objects in front of us for direct veneration, processions, et cetera. And I should explain, I learned about it on September, shortly after September 11th because of the Greek Orthodox Church that was yes. destroyed, that was at the base of the towers mm -hmm. on right. that tragic day. Yes, and so you can think of some object from that church as becoming a relic of that, and so to be in the presence of that item, that object, is to be in the pre to remind us everything to do with that day in that church. That's why we go to play, even with September 11th, that's why we still gather at places that have part of the iron structure of the building. Sure, sure. That too is a relic of that event. There are different styles in churches when it comes to Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox. With Russian Orthodoxy, we tend to think of those beautiful golden domes in the churches. Uh, how, what are the differences? Well, Russian churches originally, the first generation of them are built by men going from Constantinople. They are converted from the imperial center and there's a wonderful primary text about Russian visitors being sent um, to Constantinople and writing back that when they were in Hagia Sophia, they didn't know if they were in heaven or on earth um, and that that was the religion they should convert to. So the first generation is really not very different. Um, probably there were many more golden domes in the Byzantine world than we think of now, and certainly in Novgorod. The Hagia Sophia in Novgorod is an evocation of Constantinople. Over time, the Russian churches, many of which were built in wood, get these fantastically shaped domes. Yeah, the onion and domes. The onion domes and other shapes and St. Basil's in um, Moscow right outside and of the Kremlin and Red, Red Square, Square has all sorts of domes and they're gilded. So we think of them as being very different. But I, if you went inside and followed the paths that are needed for the performance of the religious rites, they're not that different. Right. It, again, I think it reflects the, an aesthetic that the Russian tradition has. They, from what I've been told, they like things that are tall and very dramatic and it reflected in the and it reflects in their architecture. It needs to stand out in some way. And the 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 modern the Greek aesthetic was a little bit different and and remained stayed the same. Just as our American aesthetic about architecture is very different. And I'm thinking about my home church in Florida. It does not look like a traditional church like this one that's does. Right. And apparently that, that's okay. That's okay. It, it could, inside it certainly does. Inside I'm sure it looked very similar to this, but it could be everything from the tradition of how the community built it or bought it from someone else, how they tried to make it work for what they had available to them and both the financial resources, the size of the community. Um, things like that, and then, or did they go and build it? And again, we see here in the United States, architects looking at the, the standard tradition of a dome, an apse, this layout, and then saying, well, we can use different materials. We can fuse it with a different eyepiece because this is America. We want to, we, we do things a little what different. Our aesthetic. We have our own aesthetic, and so, especially from the 50s through the, well, even to, down to today, but certainly 50s, 60s, 70s, 1950s, 60s, 70s, you see this very, kind of a, what some people call neo-Byzantine, this kind of mixture of traditional with something very, very modern. Sometimes it worked well, sometimes it didn't. <laughs> Frank Lloyd Wright did. Frank Lloyd Wright. A Greek Orthodox church. Is that right? No. Yeah. It's where, quite lovely. Where is that? The Church in Milwaukee. Milwaukee. It was one of his last commissions. It was built in the late 50s. Uh, and he designed it, but as in And it looks like a quintessential Frank Lloyd Wright? You know it's Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, structure, um, okay. Yeah, you know it's Frank Lloyd Wright, Thanks. but he, as Frank Lloyd Wright did, he designed everything from the, the building to the pews to the icon screen, everything, that was... So uh, this, obviously, there are certain rules that the architect has to follow, at least in terms of the interior, not necessarily the exterior? Well, I think the... 
the biggest rule is to separate the yeah. congregation from the holiest of holies. The way Frank Lloyd Wright did his icon screen is not like right. any other one I've ever no, seen in any not. church. <laughs> no, definitely not. No, the architect, to, an architect today will be set, will work with a community that needs to build something. They'll work with, do we want, we, we need a narthex, a nave, a sanctuary. We need space for people to move around. Does that, do those plans get approved at some point by a metropolitan? Yeah, yes. Uh, the congregation will send their plans to the local bishop for approval uh, for both the architect, the design, um, theory, on the understanding that he probably has a little more experience doing this than a typical congregation will. And then also approve who designs the icon screen, who designs the, who paints the icons, all of those kinds of things, just so that things are done well um, and properly. And again, thinking of things that a congregation wouldn't think of, like, you know, where do you, how do you get people from one end of the building to the other right. and comfort and safety? Does the altar have to face any particular direction? The tradition is they face east, uh, face the rising sun. Is that always done? Not always. Um, sometimes the real estate doesn't quite do what you want it to do. Doesn't quite fit, right. Yeah, but more often than not, that's what they try to make it happen. How does the architecture of the church reflect the artwork inside? Well, usually it's, it's built enough at the same time the artwork is added that they are of the same period. But sometimes you have very, very modern buildings in which you have brought very old images. It doesn't, even here um, in this church, which is a, a 20th century, mid 20th century church, there are elements that were built that were contemporary with it, but evoke different periods in Byzantine um, yeah. art. So. I, I don't think you can ever think of it as a one has to be like the other. It's what you want it to be is harmonious. And I think perhaps to go back to your question about Greek versus Russian, Greek architecture, like Greek traditions, often stresses the harmonious, the symmetrical, the balanced, the calm, as opposed to the dramatically exaggerated or um, unbalanced. And that, that it gives you, as in this building, a, a sense of peace to be in the space. Let's talk about some of the vestments that the yes. priests and the deacons wear. And I know you have, a, we have an, icon. an icon here. If you could hold that up sure. and give people an example of what we're talking well, about. What I'm holding up is an icon of St. Ambrose. And we know Ambrose, Ambrose of Milan, the fourth century bishop of the church. And he's wearing a bishop's vestments. A, but what's interesting... And how do we know it's a bishop's vest? Well, we know vestments. it's a bishop's vest is because he's wearing the traditional great omophorion of the bishop. We think of the bishop wearing this very large wrap over everything else, um, which crosses on it. And it carries down over here and down in front of him. And it's the quintessential vestment of a bishop. It's kind of what signifies this is a bishop of the church as opposed to the more simple stole, the epetrechilion of the priest, which is the piece that runs, it goes down his neck and in front of him, uh, or the orarion, the kind of this belt-like item that the deacon wears and holds up when he's singing the petitions. So, we, those, so each rank of clergy has these distinctive elements to it, uh, and to them rather. And yet, even in this icon, we know there's a bit of an anachronism here. Why? Well, Bishops didn't always wear this. This is a later tradition. Um, it was, it the, and so, it, again, as the church became more developed and in the first six centuries, you couldn't tell a priest from a bishop, from a deacon. Um, they, so they all kind of look the same. But as things become more structured more and rigorous around that, then the rank became important. And so the clothing item, begins to reflect the rank. Just think of it in kind of military terms, although that's a bad analogy in some ways. You can tell the generals from the privates. Sure. So, Dr. Evans, from an artist's perspective, when you look at the vestments, what do you think? Because some of them are, um, especially during services, especially during Holy Week, are quite beautiful. Oh, they're exquisite. And some of them, some of the most beautiful um, are not just the patterns, because I, I find in this tradition where you use a play of crosses against voids and 
you can read them in many ways to be exceptional. You have the ones that at the greatest are walking icons. They are the narrative scenes of the life of Christ or images of Christ and the Virgin, where if you think of the stationary icons, the icons that are the architecture of the Pantocrator and the dome, the Virgin and the apse, and then add the priest coming and going, wearing them, they're, they're kind of the most movable of icons and bring the, the whole meaning of the church to life and we're meant to do that. Um, so the, it was always meant to have a deep meaning. What we think is that in the first generations, just as we don't know what you first used to hold the wine, we don't know what the men who were serving it wore, but that they're wearing the dress in some way that was what you wore in the second, third century, which was a large tunic, and that that then evolves into the basic level of the priestly garments and the more elaborate ones, as he was saying, uh, get added as you are increasingly identifying rank and, and to a degree, certainly in the later centuries, taking on the role of the secular authority that is eroding. And we did not discuss this in the um, icon segment, but I'd like to bring it up now because I see this icon, yeah. the priests who do this with their fingers. The gesture, what does that mean? Well, it's a gesture of blessing. Um, you can see it in the icon of Christ, um, John the Baptist, and it's the gesture of blessing. Um, the traditional blessing was would be done with two fingers and then to make the sign of the cross. And then over time, the Byzantines get, and especially in icons, it stylizes it into this rather elaborate gesture, and it becomes a Christogram. It, the tradition today would tell us that we're forming the letters I C X C in our fingers. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos, and so it's not even so. Even the message is, it's not the priest who's blessing you or the bishop, it's Christ. But it starts out as a very much more simple gesture with two, two fingers. We see it today uh, sometimes just the hand as a gesture of blessing. Let's talk about the significance of the censer that is used in the service. Explain to us what that is. Well, <laughs> the censer is, is a wonderful container for incense, which when lit perfumes the space and the deacon swings it. And it is so much a role that the deacon does that Stephen, the proto martyr, the first um, saint, is shown as a deacon and he's often shown from the very earliest times swinging a censer. So in a way his Even symbol- Even he probably didn't do that in yeah. reality. <laughs> <laughs> but from, from a fairly early date, we associate it with him and censers were used everywhere. They were used in pagan temples. They were used in your private homes. Um, and why were they used? Probably to make the air smell better. Um, <laughs> and and yeah. because it's a, a luxurious gift. It's, it's among the gifts to the Christ child, um, gold, incense, Very and myrrh. Very true, right. So from the beginning, the idea that you would have this um, association. But it, it, and your question points to a lot of these things that we instantly go jump into the kind of mystical, spiritual, religious realm had very, very practical purposes. Perfume the air. The, the Jews practiced animal sacrifice. But around that sacri sacrificial table, they're burning a lot of incense. Because as you can imagine, sacrificing animals is not, isn't pleasant to the senses. And so you're trying to offset some of that. Now, people back then is, you know, are quite, would have been accustomed to animal flesh and all those kinds of things. But again, it's trying to do this in a way that was pleasing to God, cover up what needed to be covered up. Um, and, and so, and then we begin then to ascribe other kinds of significance to it as we begin to reflect on it. And certainly by today, when we're not doing any of those kinds of things. And An another uh, beautiful symbol or that is used in the, the divine liturgy is the Bible. And we've got an example over your shoulder okay. there. Talk to me about the significance of okay. what is on that Bible. Okay, and well, are they all the same in each Orthodox church? Um, Okay, it's, it's, it's the book of the Gospels. It's the book of the daily New Testament gospel lectionaries, the four evangelists for the- for Not the, the full for, Bible. Not the full Bible, not even the full New Testament. Basically the daily reading of one of the four, one of the four evangelists that's done every day 
within the liturgical cycle of the church. And th most of them uh, are, they're printed in such a way so that they're, here's the section you read today, here's the section you read tomorrow, and then other kind of events and services and things like that. And then this book is bound and then becomes decorative over time. Again, they probably weren't always this elaborate and certainly not as elaborate as the one we have here, uh, to remind us of this is an important text, part of the theater. Your eye's going to be grabbed to this. I need to pay attention to this. And also our respect. This is the Word of God. The Word of God is a treasure. We're going to cover the Word of God in our best finery. And is it standard what symbolism is on the book here, the Gospels here? Well, not altogether. If you, to go back to our icon, which in the, the depiction of the Gospel that he is holding, it's decorated with rich jewels. So the decoration with rich jewels and gold is, I think, something that one aspires to through the centuries, because this is a pattern that's very similar to the one that you see on the sixth century icon that Christ, of Christ at Sinai holding a gospel. What is usually added are images of the four evangelists because it's their words that, through which God, Christ is speaking on them. You can have crosses. Um, you can have, as on this one, beautiful flowers, auspicious symbols that are not necessarily in the beginning totally um, concrete in a religious image. And you are more than anything else showing that you respect the quality of what the word is and recognize your, its significance. And as you remember in the service, the book is brought in and is process, processed. So to have something that responds to light and sparkles is um, important. What does the Orthodox Church say, Dr. Vrame, about the trend now towards things a little bit more ornate, a little bit more embellished? Because a lot of people say Christianity is about keeping it simple. Keeping it simple. Well, I think the two examples here show that over time our understanding of who we are as Christians and as church also reflects these things. And so we, uh, right, so we would say this embellished, quite elaborate patent and chalice is reminding us of the heavenly kingdom. When you're with the king, you want to bring out the things that are the most elaborate, the most beautiful that you can have, and we would associate that with these two items here. But yet, we're in a moment perhaps now too where some people are saying, no, well, we, that king was a simple king, Jesus. He, he never wore a crown. He never wore fancy you know, robes or anything like that. And so the style would reflect this, the one that's in, right in front of me, much more simple. And so we're constantly navigating through that. You also often hear the term house of God. Do we have a responsibility to keep faithful to that term? Is this a house of God? I think all Christians have a responsibility to, and wherever they are worshiping, yeah. uh, respect that term. Yeah, we say this is the place where God dwells, where we interact with God most directly. Yeah, I can step outside in the courtyard here and interact with God in prayer and things like that. But it's here where it's more a little, it's more concentrated in some way, more focused and trying to draw me in more intentionally than when I'm walking down the hill and admiring the trees and the flowers. And I can look at those trees and flowers and say, what a wonderful God we have who gave us these things. But uh, yeah, it's the house of God. And it's consecrated. I mean, to agree, yeah. that's what you're saying. This is a space that was built and people of faith came together and said, this is a place we will worship. Right, uh, which goes to the term holy, that this is a holy space, this whole building. And holy at its core understanding was set apart. And so this place was set apart for one task and one thing only, and that was to glorify God. Uh, it wasn't meant to, you know, become a kitchen. It wasn't meant to be a, something else. It wasn't meant even to be a TV studio. Which some people have which criticized. Which some people have wondered about. Right. Why are we doing this here? But we're doing... But Why are we doing it here? Well, because this is a teaching... The church is also a teaching space. We have a pulpit where the congregation is instructed. We have... Uh, 
place where we're, we can gather around and we can hear a sermon and we hear the Word of God read to us so we can learn it. And so this, this space is becoming just a new place with a new medium of expression and to, to communicate the same gospel truth that I can read to you or preach to you from a pulpit. Well, Dr. Brame and Dr. Evans, thank you so much for your time. And to see more programs in this series, Discovering Orthodox Christianity, please visit youtube.com slash Greek Orthodox Church. I'm Stacey Spanos. Thanks for joining us.